people thought Juicero was about the money and it, that it was about fake. And mm -hmm. what I can say is it wasn't about the money. What it was for me was an opportunity to close the gap of fresh produce, that mm -hmm. the U.S. dietary guidelines were recommending that people consume seven to 13 servings of fruits and vegetables every day. And the average American was consuming less than one. And that one serving that they had could have been French fries. After losing his aunt to diabetes and his mother to stomach cancer, Doug Evans became a serial health food entrepreneur who began sprouting over 25 years ago. And today he's become one of the world's leading advocates for the benefits of sprouting. You're eating the standard American diet. That's right. And everything that comes along with that. Your family is starting to have some health challenges. So let's walk us through what that experience was like leading up to you meeting Denise. Yeah. So um, watching water boil happens really slowly, right? Mm -hmm. So everyone around me was eating cooked food, processed food, meat, chicken, fish, dairy, Chinese food, soul food, um, pizza, Italian food, Greek food. Like we just ate. Like the, the idea of food was somewhat a reward system once I became financially quasi-independent where I could afford to eat in a restaurant and like I wasn't eating in Michelin star restaurants, but I could afford to go to a steakhouse or I could get a hot dog in the street or I could go to a nice Chinese restaurant and we just ate. Mm. And then the first kind of clue that something was wrong with the diet was when my aunt got diabetes and we were told that they were going to have to chop off her feet below her ankles, like a double amputation. And for me, you know, I guess I was just around 30 or so when that happened. Like, it's incomprehensible to me to envision what it would be like. Like now we could see like guys like Stephen Hawking had incredible lives, you know, using his brain and, and little things with little faculty. And there's people at the time for me to just think about someone close to me losing their feet was a very, very hard thing to process. And then ultimately she died of, of complications associated with diabetes after the amputation. And then my uncle died of heart disease. And then my other uncle died of heart disease. And then my mother got stomach cancer and died. And, and it was like within three months, like I thought maybe she had an ulcer or had something else or, or you mm -hmm. know, whatever, like, a, a kid who doesn't want his mother to die is thinking, but we were in, in definitive denial that she was dying. And she like went downhill and she died. And then my father died of heart disease in the same hospital as my mother. And then my brother, who was less active than me, my older brother, ended up becoming overweight, obese, having the first of three strokes and a heart attack. Mm. That, and then I met Denise. At a nightclub at two in the morning. At two in the morning, yeah. And I was <laughs> still like just out there, you know, not wanting to go home. You know, it's like that movie Repo Man. Like, where could we go next? <laughs> okay. And she told you, tells you about this funny type of diet. Yeah. I mean, what well, you know, Denise, Denise was um, vegetarian going vegan. Mm -hmm. And I had never heard of vegan. And I had known vegetarians. I actually, it was really powerful for me. I just did, you know, a class with John Robbins who wrote Diet for a New America. And someone had given me his book like 10 years before I became vegetarian or vegan. And 
I opened up the book and it talked about all these atrocities to the animals. And I closed up the book and I stored it on my shelf with the book cover spine on the inside. So you would only see the paper because th there was something haunting in the words of that book that I didn't want to read. That was, you know, the expression, the blinders on, the cognitive dissidence of not wanting to, to know. And so I could continue life as it was without having to face the atrocities that I was directly or indirectly participating on in. And then how did this lead to you co-founding Organic Avenue with Denise? You know, um, I, I really was attracted to Denise. Yeah. And um, we ended up spending a lot of time together. And then we became a couple. And Denise was working as a speech language pathologist at United Cerebral Palsy. And so she had like, her heart was into helping people. And, you know, she was very loving, very compassionate. Her sister died of leukemia when she was seven. And so I like, and Denise was commuting from my apartment in the West Village to Long Island to go to United Cerebral Palsy. And mm. so I said, look, why don't we, why don't you do something that you're passionate about? So she was exploring like doing tofu cheesecakes or doing like the beginning of e-commerce for um, different, you know, natural products. And then I moved into a loft space in Chinatown and in there, we said, well, maybe we'll have some potlucks and we'll invite people over. Maybe we'll have like a movie night and we'll show conscious movies, who killed the electric car or the like. Um, and when we would come over and then we would do these dinner port, it turns out the potlucks were a bomb because people wouldn't bring, you know, high enough quality food that, that to, to work. So then we said, well, maybe we'll bring in a chef. So Denise went to the raw food festival in Oregon and recruited like top raw chefs to come. And then we would have dinner parties. And then, you know, we learned about juice. We learned about raw food. We started to buy products. So when people came over, they could take some product with them and go home. And then that became the genesis of Organic Avenue. And you were operating the whole thing from your loft in, in um, Chinatown, correct? Yeah, for a couple of years. Yeah. So until, until we had so much inventory and no foot traffic, the only time people could come is when we invited them or had an event or something. And mm -hmm. then, like to me, we had more inventory than it cost for rent. So it made <laughs> sense like, oh, we'll get a store you know, and then work in the store and then you could get foot traffic and be available and make it a thing. Right. You know, this is 2002 and the idea of opening up a store in Manhattan, it seems very costly. What was your financial situation at the time? How did you, how were you able to make that happen? I mean, I, I was always working, always saving money and uh -huh like very calculated. Like I remember we furnished the store with furniture from Ikea, right? Okay. We, and we bought like the absolute necessities. Like we went to um, the garment district and we found some glass shelves and racks and we found like a handyman to help put them together. And we sanded the original wood floors and we did it. Think we did things in a very scrappy, entrepreneurial way. Mm. I remember the beautiful, beautifully minimal orange branding. Did you design that? I did not. Um, a different Rand student did. Mm. Interesting. <laughs> and I, I didn't have the talent, and he was really not not very good for my confidence regarding my design. It was good right. for my confidence in execution, but mm. not in the design. So I found a, another Rand student, a friend of, of, of mine that I, that I trusted who did this every day. 
that I thought would be able to embody, you know, what um, Paul would think was was good. All right. And this was your first exposure to sprouts. You mentioned in the book, the sprout guy would come and deliver the sprouts from upstate New York. Yeah. Yeah, we got that. And I was probably, you know, uh, exposed to the sprouts a little bit even earlier than that in the uh, or farmer's market. But we would right. get sprouts delivered and wheatgrass delivered, you know, by some guy named, you know, Harley. It was just, you know, so such a, you know, a seemingly different lifetime. Mm-hmm. You know, when you when I think about how many years ago, like two decades, mm-hmm. I mean, over two two years ago, um, seems like a long time. And you said that business grew a hundred percent a year. And you exited it and 10 years later. So were you financially sort of quotes free at that moment in time where you could pretty much do whatever you wanted to do? I, I mean, to a certain extent, everything is relative. For yeah. my for my lifestyle, yes, right? Because I could buy, I could buy raw food, I could, I could go where I wanted to go. And I never got hooked on the trappings. Like I didn't want debt. I didn't you know, need, like to me, fancy cars would be more anxiety. Like, where are you going to park them? Now you're going to have to get a garage. What if someone scratches them? So like, I, I really think, you know, the automobiles were not designed for utility as much as they were for ego. And so I didn't want to be stuck in that trap. Like I had a, an aversion to the trappings of fancy and material um, things even back then, whether I could afford them or not. Right, and then there was the Juicero era where um, you it was a five year long thing. You kind of glossed over that in the book. Um, what do what do people get wrong about Juicero? I mean, what they got wrong was all the writings and all the things were all about a mockery of Silicon Valley and a mockery mm-hmm. of me and this. Yeah machine that you could squeeze the pack by hand. Mm-hmm. When in fact, um, I had 10 years of making juice by hand, right? Mm-hmm. Using semi-mechanical advances to make juice. So right. I knew a lot about making juice. And one of the observations that I had was that unsweetened green juice or even green juice that was sweetened was the best possible, healthiest beverage option one could have other than spring water. And if you look at the alternatives to beverages that people could have, beer, wine, soda, energy drinks, highly processed juices from concentrated that were pasteurized, um, or making fresh juice in a juicer. So anecdotally, people who had a home juicer were maybe using them once or twice a month. But people who had an espresso machine were using it once or twice a day. And you could say, well, you could just go buy a bottle of juice from the grocery store. So it turns out that there is a federal law that makes it illegal to sell raw juice over interstate lines or in retail. Like if you're selling juice on a shelf in a supermarket and you're not making that juice in that store, it must be pasteurized, which means they are either cooking it um, to kill the microbial activity by 5 million to one, or they're putting so much cold pressure on it to kill all the microbial activity five million to one. So mm-hmm. for me, as a raw vegan, I wanted raw juice. So we resisted doing the processed pasteurized juice. So my insight was that the way you make cold pressed juice was that you take the produce, you triple wash it, then you dice it, slice it, grind it, shred it, so that you're opening up all the cell walls of the fiber so that you then couldn't put into a piece of cheesecloth and then separate the juice 
from the fiber. And mm. if you couldn't squeeze juice out of the pack by hand, then there would be something wrong with that pack. It had to be. But the fact was, it was mostly fresh cut produce and maybe some free liquid. But if you think about the dexterity and faculty of these hands in combined with your eyes and the senses, you could easily wring it, but you'd have to invest two minutes into wringing it like you would a towel. Mm -hmm. And I, of course, as well as anyone who was in the juicing business, and we could, we could go watch a little video of Norwalk Juicer and you could see their process. And the Norwalk juicer was $2,500. At Organic Avenue, we started with one Norwalk juicer. Then we got a second one and a third one and a fourth one and a fifth one. And those would cost $2,500 each. And so my vision was, if you bought a Norwalk for $2,500, you still had to do buy the produce, wash the produce, make the juice, then clean the juicer. So the, the idea was if you could take the, the product of the grinding shredding, putting it into a cheesecloth bag, and then the patent said, you take that cheesecloth bag with the produce, you put it into another bag that has a spout, you could then insert that into a juicero press, or if you wanted to spend three times the amount, put into a Norwalk press, and it would press out the juice. And so that was the, the, the idea of Juicero. And what happened was if, if we were creating a solar farm and raised $100 million, no one would even write a press release. If Starbucks was creating a new coffee grinding plant for $100 million, no one cares. When you get a, a guy from New York who is running a lemonade stand and he goes to Silicon Valley and big investors, Google and Kleiner Perkins and, and big people invest, then all of a sudden you're on the radar. You're on, just on the radar and you have a target. And so then um, a series of mistakes, you know, good things happen. So this is the great part about you, Sarah. I came up with an idea that was creative, out of the box, had never been done before. I wrote some patents, so we got 40 patents. I hired a bunch of teams. I went to Canal Street. I had a Chinese kitchen place that I knew from my Organic Avenue days, build me my first prototype so I could take the produce, put in cheesecloth, put in a Ziploc bag, put in my early Juicero press, pressed it, and you were getting the best juice ever. There was very different, there was very little between the first machine I made and the 20th version that shipped. Mm -hmm. And then I went to Silicon Valley and I raised $120 million. And then we hired 50 engineers, nine food scientists, quality experts, um, 12 PhDs in en electrical engineering and packaging and firmware and software. And, you know, I'm not patting myself on the back, but we sold thousands of machines. We sold over 1 million servings in our first year. The mm -hmm. business was doing a million dollars a month and growing. And so from my perspective, I was like, wow, that was really great. Now I made some mistakes. And one mistake was I wasn't meditating enough. I was <laughs> working seven days a week. I was still, you know, listening to everyone the, on the board as if they were my drill sergeants, wanting to please them, et cetera. And then when they suggested that the company bring in a new CEO, who was the former chief operating officer of Coca-Cola, and, you know, the way they painted that picture it was very glorified, like, Doug, you know, you can design the trains, he'll make them run on time. He knows about leadership and raising capital and building teams and scaling globally and retail and all of these things. 
And I was like, if you guys think this is the right thing to do, then I, you know, I, I'm on the team. I'll agree with that. And to all founders out there, when you are a founder CEO and then you are no longer the CEO, you're just a founder, it's possible that all of your authority can be removed and you become like a figurehead and something just off in the side. And to me, that was the beginning and the end of the company. And nine months later, they shut Juicero down. Much mm. to, you know, much to my sadness and much to um, what I learned is that that happened for me. Mm -hmm. I'm not a victim. No one made this thing come up and put a gun to my head. These were the decisions that I made based on my prior historical trauma, my military experience, my design, and my opportunistic and my desire to please, and my not taking breaths, and me just wanting to work and work and follow this path. And turns out, you know, that was a decision that I made that should have required more thoughtfulness and more reflection. And um, Juicero got composted. And what emerged from the compost was this idea for Sprouts. Hey, really quickly, if you like this content or if you don't like it, let me know down in the comments because your likes and comments are going to help me learn what you want more of. And then that way I can keep bringing you the good stuff. All right. Thanks so much for your feedback and back to the show. Was that revelation relatively immediate or did it take some time for you to get there? Maybe another one of those Vipassana trainings or something in order for you to really embody that sense of, hey, this happened for me and not to me. I mean, it took probably years and it's still, I'm still processing. That. <laughs> okay. That's honest. So I'm still processing that. I think yeah. at the time it was more shock. Like okay. One day, like, you know, I was pouring my heart into this every day. And mm -hmm. like whatever, you know, the, the whatever the the advisors or the board were telling me to do, I was doing mm -hmm. like I could be combative. But in this case, you know, with the board, I was never combative. I was so agreeable because mm -hmm. they were doing things that were defying gravity. Like, mm -hmm. you know, at every step of the way, like what we launched, you know, was an incredible product. And, you know, the greatest um, part, I'm glad we're circling back to that. The greatest part of that story for me, the Juicero experience, was my original vision was that people used an espresso machine once or twice a day. People were using their Juicero machine once or twice a day. And the people who were drinking soda, energy drinks, processed um, juice, coffee, who will never drink cold pressed green juice, um, they weren't our audience and they were the haters. And mm -hmm. there was much more of them than us. And unlike what I'm doing now with launching a movement for Sprouts, you know, I had, you know, a few hundred followers on Twitter. I had 3,000 followers on Instagram. I had no presence. All of my, you know, sales and all of my work was focused on recruiting people to the company and raising capital. So mm -hmm. I did not have an outward facing community aspect to anyone to defend anything that I did. And so the, the misinformation that was out there relative to Juicero was beyond my wildest dreams. Like I couldn't believe that legitimate media organizations were telling half truths and exaggerating them and could be so out of integrity. Like I had never experienced that Machiavellian malice. Like mm -hmm. I never heard that I never, because of my meditation and my lifestyle, like I don't read the newspaper. I don't read like, the gossip parts. So I never even understood the notion of clickbait. It just mm -hmm. wasn't in my stratosphere. Mm -hmm. And that just, you know, drove things. But if they got anything wrong, 
which was your question, and this was a long, circuitous answer, um, people thought Juicero was about the money and it, that it was about fake. And mm -hmm. what I can say is it wasn't about the money and Juicero was real as anything and was had its great utility. And what it was for me was an opportunity to close the, the gap of fresh produce, that mm -hmm. the U.S. dietary guidelines were recommending that people consume seven to 13 servings of fruits and vegetables every day. And the average American was consuming less than one. And that one serving that they had could have been French fries. So, so to me, the idea to make it easier for people to have a fresh, raw, unpasteurized juice without setup, without cleanup, even if it would cost a lot of money. Like, who cares? Like, we live in a, a society where you can fly to Mexico on Volaris, on United, on net jets, a private jet, what have you. And that same flight from Mexico City, you know, to LA could cost $69 to $69 a second if you are flying, flying a charter G5 um, to go there. And people have the right. So the fact that the juicer was expensive, the version one was expensive, like we weren't forcing people to buy it. Like the people who bought it loved it. And, right. but it, it's just that it was such an education to understand how you could be doing all the right things. Like if, if anyone would have asked me what could go wrong with Juicero, I would have said someone could get sick. You're doing raw mm -hmm. produce. You're doing raw juice. You're you're on the fringe of of non-pasteurizing part that someone could get sick. And like, if someone gets sick, that's really bad, mm -hmm. right? I never would have thought it would have been like some farce of a financial escapade that would bring the company down. But that's so. So when I saw that. And I was just on the phone yesterday with a a major um, entrepreneur, executive investor, and we were talking about Sprouts, and we were talking about Juicero, and every aspect of Juicero he loved. He's like, I loved my Juicero. I loved using it. I loved the convenience. I loved the design. Doug, you did a great job, and. For him, in my mind, because of all the evisceration in the media, like I thought like I should duck my head in the sand and never come out. And then there are people who I respect who love the machine, who love the product, and were like, oh, Doug, it's not the critic who counts. It's the man who gets in the ring. So when I realized like I got in the ring, I actually did a really good job for my first time in the ring in Silicon Valley, right? Going from, you know, you look at my career. I was a, I was a graffiti writer. Then I was a paratrooper. Then I was a graphic design intern. And then I did some different jobs. And then I ended up, you know, running a juice bar, which is pretty low tech. Although I did program the website. I did design spreadsheets to manage the logistics where we could do thousands of deliveries a day and our e-commerce stuff, but it was still like low tech stuff. We weren't really inventing things, but then to go to Silicon Valley and actually invent something that was a combination of hardware, software, packaging, fresh produce, you know, connected things like this was a lot of brain expansion part, new materials, stretching my imagination and my brain and my skill set exponentially, simultaneously in multiple directions and recruiting and capital raising and investor relations. And, you know, who trains you how to run a board meeting? It's not like I went to Harvard <laughs> Business School and, and had any training whatsoever. So the fact like I went there and I look at it and I go, wow, you know, in the whole scheme of things, 
Like, I'm pretty proud of myself. Like, my ego's not out of control. The business was shut down. Clearly, I was responsible for everything that happened. And now, if I get to do something else, look at those lessons. Like, I, I read a lot of books. I didn't read the lessons of how to prevent these things. Like, I read different lessons of what to do, but everyone's life journey is different and the circumstances of which they're exposed to are different. So the best thing that you could do is be influenced by what other people are doing, but then really reflect on my own experiences and see how could I apply them to um, whatever I'm doing next. So speaking of which, I mean, it sounds like you're very, um, and maybe maybe the general public did not realize this, but how mission focused you actually were. Because, you know, our mutual friend, Amanda from Moon Juice, she kind of had the same thing. You know, she got caught up in that sort of the perception of, oh, this is for the affluent. So let's make fun of it. Let's stereotype it. Let's caric caricaturize it. And so when you get caught up in that, then it, yeah, it becomes about something completely different than what the, your original purpose is in relationship to all of that. And you're asking this question after the fact, which is what would serve the world better at a fraction of a cost of the cost of the Juicero machine, even though that is at a fraction of a cost compared to a Norwalk machine, which every, obviously the media ignores. But what were the answers that came to you and how did you land on going all in because I don't know anybody who's more in on sprouts than, than you are. Yeah. I mean, I, I I don't know if you and I um went to Air One together, but I know we've both been probably in Air One in the same day in sure. the same year in the same store. Um so on one of my last trips to Air One, I filled up a big you know, Yeti-like cooler, an Arctic cooler, 60-liter cooler with all this prepared gourmet, raw vegan food, fresh produce, et cetera. Fill up the, the cooler, come out to Joshua Tree, come out to Wonder Valley Hot Springs. I go into my yard and like, I'm fine. Like I've got the, the Milky Way, I've got the hot springs, I got the stars, my yurt, you know, I feel grounded. You know, I don't have a, uh, I, I, I don't have a, a cement floor in the yard. It's, you know, it's like I'm grounded. And the next day, as I go into the cooler, the ice packs are melting, and the food supply is dwindling. So I go onto my phone. My favorite app was Happy Cow. Go anywhere in the world. Go to Happy Cow. Sure. Yeah. And I I do vegan. Nothing. Do vegetarian, nothing. Do veg friendly, nothing. <laughs> and like the the things that were close to me were Del Taco, 7-Eleven, Burger King. And and then when I used Google Maps and I ultimately found the whole foods in La Quinta was like an hour and 15 minutes, an hour and a half away. So I suck it up. I get in the car and I'm like, this is not why I moved to the desert to be driving all this distance. So that night I'm soaking in the hot springs, looking up at the stars in the Milky Way. Mm -hmm may or may not have been hallucinating and seeing every star twinkling into a sprouting tail. Mm. And I'm like, no, really? Wow. And I'm getting this download from the, the heavens, from the skies, from the universe, that number one, sprouts were vegetables. Number two, those vegetables contained every micronutrient, phytonutrient, polyphenol, bioflavonoid, antioxidant, amino acid for complete proteins as mature vegetables. 
all in the sprouts. And number three, sprouts had medicinal properties. I had no idea of that, that those medicinal properties were backed by thousands of published white papers by top universities and scientists around the world. This was just coming to me like, oh, sprouts were medicine. So the next morning, I'm really excited. I go online and I see that there's many more options in 2018 than there were um, in 1999 to 2002, um, that now you could get alfalfa, azuki, arugula, radish, clover, broccoli, chia, mustard, fenugreek, all sorts of lentils, all sorts of peas, all sorts of strains of hemp seeds that would sprout in their hulls. And I was like, wow. So within a month, I've got six jars in rotation and I'm growing thousands of calories of vegetables in days, not weeks, months, or years for like under a dollar a serving, AKA pennies a serving. Mm -hmm. I'm feeling light, energetic, alive, satiated, bright and clear. And I'm like, wow, this is too good to be true. Like, this is unbelievable. Within a month, basically, I'm eating sprouts. Thank you so much for watching. Just FYI, we post a new video almost every day. So make sure you comment and subscribe below so you don't miss out on anything. And if you enjoyed this video, I think you're really going to love this one as well. And if you ever want to see a playlist of all of my podcasts or all of the plot twists or any other category of videos, you can find links to those in the description below.